Hello and welcome to The Print. I'm TCA Sharad Raghavan and today I'm going to be in conversation with Mr. Arvind Subramanian. He was the former chief economic advisor to India during a crucial phase where a lot of reforms happened. The GST came in, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code came in, electoral bonds came in and demonetization happened all during the time that he was CEA. But apart from that, he's also he's currently advisor to the governments of Tamil Nadu and Punjab. So he has a lot to say about the Indian economy. So without further ado, let's get on with it. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Subramanian, for joining us. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sharad. I would just add the other thing that was done was the uh, you know codification of the inflation uh, uh, thing that also happened during the oh, time. Oh, absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, now you are also a prolific writer in 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 our uh, newspapers, and you've been talking about the GDP numbers. So recently, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman said that uh, for Q4 of this year, we're on track to even surpass 8% and which will take us past 8% for the whole year. Now I've read what you've written and uh, about the numbers and your issues with the deflator. But structurally, do you feel that our, the Indian economy is on track for strong growth, even if the government stops pumping it as it is right now? Or is the FM overstating our potential? Yeah, uh, it's, I'll answer this in two parts. You know. One, one, the numbers, you know, the, the seven and a half, eight percent for the year as a whole. Right. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of uh, back and forth has been going on this, whether it's the GVA or the GDP and all these things. But there's a very simple way to look at this, right? Or two simple things. Um, for the year as a whole, I think uh, nominal GDP growth is going to be about just over 9.2. I think that's mm -hmm. the number, right? And you just take a look at what inflation is in the economy, right? Uh, if you you know sixty percent of the economy is services, I'm talking about the producer side, not the G, on right. the GVA side, and CPI inflation, which measures services, is about five five and a half percent. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you apply some some you know a plausible inflation number for the economy, uh, it's which is somewhere between four and five and a half. Uh, you get a real GDP growth of between four, five, four to five and a half, somewhere in that range, which is not bad, uh, but which is nowhere close to what you know the government is claiming. It's just, uh, and uh, the other point I would make is that if you look at the latest numbers, the discrepancy for the year as a whole uh, right. is about four, over four percentage points. So out of the seven and a half, seven point six, mm. uh, f about four is is accounted for by the discrepancy, uh, uh, wow. which, which is uh, you know. Which, so just to give you a sense, but I want to say that uh, I, I think even four to five five and a half is not bad you know it's the economy is, is doing reasonably well it's not a, a a bad which is about three to three and a half per capita GDP growth because mm -hmm. the population is down so that's I, th I think the uh, uh, the first point to 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 recognize your uh, more important question is the second part of your question which is that are we structurally poised for something big hmm? right and I think that that's a very important question to ask because I certainly think that there are two big things that have happened that make that you know very reasonable that you know to say that yes indeed uh, India is poised. One of course is all the things that the government has done you know the infrastructure, the connectivity, the banks are cleaned up you know all of those things have happened uh, which again create a launching pad and the next big thing of course is uh, the China plus one opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that uh, what I've been most encouraged by you know I've, I was in Tamil Nadu recently if you look at especially Tamil Nadu and Karnataka you are seeing the first trickle of this C plus one investment in manufacturing with one absolutely big difference from the past that now the companies are coming in and willing to produce at scale. When I mean scale, I mean in terms of employment. Right. There are factories that are coming up that are, you know, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 employees in a way that never happened in India before. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's where I think that, you know, there's, you know, there's reason to be hopeful about the thing. But against that, I, uh, let, let me just give you two, two numbers. Private investment is resolutely flat. Absolutely. It hasn't picked up. So you kind of wonder, you know, 
why isn't it showing up in the data mm -hmm. if all these good things are happening, especially if there's a China plus one opportunity, especially if the banking system is ready to extend credit. And the second is that, you know, uh, maybe even more telling, FDI is collapsing as a share of GDP. Yes. Uh, so, so I think that on, on the outcome side, certainly the, the hope that we have has not translated into outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, but, the, but the other thing I would say is that why I'm a little bit cautious and maybe even a bit skeptical is that on two big things, I think the, uh, uh, the government has turned inward in, 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 in a serious way. Uh, and therefore, whether, uh, because we know that to get 7-8% growth, you have to export you know, 10%, you know, uh, uh, you cannot grow at 8% consistently on the basis of the domestic market. The domestic market just isn't big Especially enough. Especially if it's just government investment. Exactly. Uh, 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 and, and no, and even if you say uh, government is pushing it, but we have, we can also sell to consumers mm -hmm. uh, and, and that market, it's not very big. Uh, so that's one reason. And the other reason is that when you try and think about why are, why is investment not picking up? Why is FDI not coming in in, in you know in huge amounts? Remember, it's FDI is not only not coming uh, coming down, but India's share of non-China FDI has also declined. Absolutely. So it's not a uh, it, it is an India-specific phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You wonder whether the government is not doing something or is doing even something that it shouldn't be doing. That's you know putting off investment. You know you can talk about the arbitrary uh, action favoring some over others. Uh, you know. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So those are plausible reasons why maybe so. So in the way I always put it is that you know the hardware uh, we're, we're catching up on the hardware very nicely, but the software of policy you know is still is still kind of lagging behind. Right. So um, now FDI was something I wanted to ask you about because the numbers are showing that both in absolute levels and as a share of global FDI, India has been falling. You spent a lot of time in the US uh, and uh, you've spent a lot of time with the business community there. Do you feel that to them India still remains a bright spot to invest in or is that sheen wearing off? No, see, I, I think, remember, uh, as they say, it's all relative in this business, mm -hmm. right? You know, it, it's not how India is doing, as they say, the joke is, you know, uh, when you, uh, uh, when two people uh, confront a panther, uh, you know, you don't have to run faster than the panther, you have to run faster than the Indeed. other guy, right? So in a sense, so I think India will continue to be in the spotlight as an opportunity, you know, in large part because China is declining, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and Europe is also struggling. So in some ways, the potential bright spots in the economy, the big ones, are still the US and India, right? right. So, so Ch India will continue to be uh, in the spotlight, it will continue to be an attractive market, but, you know, from those opportunities and intentions and translating it into actually uh, you know investment on the ground uh, i think that's where i think something is coming in between uh, it's probably maybe some rigidities maybe some time lags but also it has to do with some aspects of government policies which i think still frustrates investors so let's uh, i mean investigate that a little bit more what in particular, would you say are the problems with government policy or to do with when you say arbitrary action? What are some of those examples that would really irk investors? I mean, we've seen, see, in the last three or four years, we've seen a lot of action favoring some invest, uh, you know, investors over others. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, I, 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 I don't want to know name names, but we know, you know, we know who the names are. So, so these regulatory favors have, uh, you know, uh, created the sense that the level playing field is not quite level, right? right. Uh, and some investors have been hurt by, you know, the reversal of policies, uh, you know, the, the fact that, you know, I think people are wary to enter into sectors where, you know, some of the big actors are more prominent. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's also, you know, a, a state action against some investors and not other investors, right. uh, you know, especially uh, some who are not uh, big. So, uh, you know, I can only speculate. And then, of course, there's the inward turn as well, which has happened very... Right. Yeah. You mean uh, high tariffs? Uh, and... Tariffs going up, you know, again, uh, import licensing, even computers one, at one point, laptops right. we thought would be thing. There were reversal. Uh, uh, so, so, and I think this, to be fair to this government, I think this government 
does believe genuinely that you know import substitution not like in the past in the extreme form of the past Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, some amount of import substitution, uh, you know, uh, for a variety of new reasons as well, you know, the self-reliance, the strategic reasons. But it is a policy that once again says, you know, we have to become more self-reliant. And, and, and so if you turn inward in that sense, can India become a launching pad to be globally competitive? You know, that's always going to be uh, in question. I see. And uh, now we are talking, you you mentioned uh, some actions against some companies and uh, not against others. Uh, you were also the CEA when a lot of discussions were happening on electoral bonds and also when they were notified. So now from the finance ministry's side, were there any reservations voiced about the opacity that was being brought into uh, political funding? So, I uh, see, uh, I, I'm not trying to duck the question. I was completely uh, not part of these electoral bond discussions. Uh, as you know, the, the, uh, the primary actors were uh, Arun Jaitley and RBI and Subhash Karg, they were right. the ones. So I had absolutely no involvement in these electoral bonds at all. Uh, but just as an outside observer, uh, to me, at least, one of the striking things about what has come out is that, you know, it's kind of the dog that didn't bark. What are the names that you don't see or the big prominent names that you don't see, which kind of suggests that, you know, electoral bonds are probably are, you know, are, are, are a small fraction of, you know, whatever political financing that takes place. And uh, those have not been, you know, addressed by any means. And the rest uh, then, uh, by definition, is unaccounted for. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's a common view that uh, electoral bonds probably account for, I don't know, I'm making up the number, but a very small fraction of total election financing or election expenditure. Right. Yeah. So, so the so other argument is that uh, some of it was going through trusts, but uh, you feel that the rest is actually in just cash. No, cash or just we don't know how it works. It's, it's just a, a black box. Maybe some people do. But we know what we know is the magnitudes uh, of financing that happened via ele electoral bonds are a, a pretty small fraction of the total fin funding that takes place of elections. Right. And uh, now, again, you were CEA during demonetization. Uh, I have two questions related to uh, demo. One is... Now, several years have passed and you can probably speak about this, but what kind of warning was the finance ministry given before the action was announced? I mean, all this is history, Sharad. You know, this is not, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you delve into uh, uh, policy, I mean, all we know is that this was something that, uh, you know, uh, the prime minister and his office were in charge of and they kind of and there were you know contacts in finance ministry and the rbi between the three of them they kind of planned it but who did what when you know uh, i think it's all history and you know forgotten history right. now but the other thing is that uh, you were uh, also most likely privy to the discussions on what the gains and what the aims of demonetization were now, with all of these years of hindsight, do you feel that any of those aims or gains have come about? See, uh, remember that the uh, the objectives of demonetization kind of, you know, even the stated objectives right. sort of changed over time. Over mm -hmm. time, they were initially about money laundering and black money. And over time, it became about, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, more uh, more transparency, less cash. It changed over time, but I think if you just look at the numbers, what you see is, uh, is something which is a bit of a paradox. All right, what you see today, you know, whatever six seven years after demonetization, is digitalization has picked up. That was you know that became also that was also one of the objectives right. of demonetization, which came in later. Which came in later, one of the later objectives, uh, but it has picked up. So at one level, you could say, wow, it achieved objective. But the paradox is that the cash to GDP also is now much higher than uh, right. post demonetization. So, so both cash has gone up and, de and digitalization has gone up. And, and you know, sort of both are going up. So, so that's kind of a little bit of a paradox that needs to be understood much better. So why, why people still prefer so much cash? cash yeah. And also do more digital, you know, both. Right. Uh, yeah. Because I'm saying these are all, the, when I say cash, I'm not talking about absolute numbers. I'm talking about the cash to GDP ratio. Right. Uh, has gone up similarly. The, probably the digital to GDP ratio have gone up as well. So both have gone up. Okay. And uh, 
Now, coming back to the businesses and possibly with some of the issues that they have currently with the policy, in I think your 2015-16 uh, economic survey, you talked about the Chakravyu challenge uh, of the Indian economy that companies find it far easier to enter business than they do to exit when they want to. And you talked about how the insolvency and bankruptcy code would help this. Now, again, it's been several years since the IBC has been in place, but the time taken to come up with a resolution plan has just been increasing and the amount recovered has remained about flat, about 30%. Is this the kind of thing that you had envisaged or in the implementation has it somehow failed? Yeah, I, I, I think that um, certainly the IBC was going to be one of the big instruments for facilitating exit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially because the excesses of the 2000s had led to this twin balance sheet challenge. Right. Uh, now, I think what happened with the IBC was um, it started off in 2017 very well. You know, right. uh, the RBIs put 12, uh, you know, big uh, 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 companies for resolution. Um, but something happened along the way which led to the kind of outcomes that you suggested that um, enormous delays and um, uh, recovery rates are still quite mm -hmm. small. Now, I think it's, to be fair, uh, I, I think ha having the IBC uh, was probably much better than not having IBC, mm -hmm. one. Second, also, those numbers may be obscure, uh, an important gain, which is the very fact of having this, of having go through resolution, means that parties settle even without going, to, because it acts like a you know a, like a deterrent uh, effect, right. and and so probably there have been some gains which you should kind of add to uh, you know whatever has happened so far, mm -hmm. but somewhere along the way, um, uh, you know, uh, th this mechanism was thwarted, I think. Uh, you know, in, in some ways which I don't fully understand. And therefore, uh, it's become uh, slow recoveries are not as, uh, as much as they should be. And I, I just get the sense that maybe uh, the, the, pol the politics and the political economy of this have become, you know, more intractable and difficult as time has gone along. Uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, some people don't want... Uh, 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 IBC to to happen as quickly or whatever, but the overall stepping back. So uh, the verdict has to be uh, better than what it would have been without the IBC. Right. Uh, but uh, significantly below what we hoped would happen with the IBC, which is you know after all the time uh, the delays that you talk about are well in excess of what was actually uh, you know stipulated in the well, IBC. Absolutely, uh, it's IBC. about two and a half times. times uh, yeah. uh, uh, and, and so I think that. Um, you see, let me make one last point, which is, which I think is the way I would say is what is uh, a way of looking at the IBC, which people I think maybe don't look at, uh, is that the costs of the fact that the IBC was not as successful as it should have been, mm -hmm. is that so much capital, A, has been lying unused right to and the delay have led to the value of that capital so the opportunity cost of capital not deployed of capital whose value has shrunk that is the real cost of the relative non success of the ibc okay. right. and that we don't think about carefully so it's it's we we speak about you know delays and recoveries and on the other side mm -hmm. they say you know but you know things did happen but the real cost is the opportunity cost of the capital that was you know 10 years so much capital lying idle uh, uh, probably lost i know half its value and that's right. the real cost of not having done the ibc more effectively and then again, when these assets are when when they try to sell them, since they've lost all of this value, they find no takers. So and, then and that's it why stretches the on. Yeah, exactly, and the recovery rates are low for that reason. Right. So that's the, so the it's the opportunity cost of of this that, and I think the other. I, I don't want to be curmudgeonly. I think the government gets a lot of credit for you know, and the RBI for whatever cleaning up the banking system. You know, NPAs have come mm -hmm. down, but I think we must also recognize that. 
a lot of the cleaning up happened via just recapitalization and write-offs. Right. Right. Which is basically throwing money and money at the problem. Yes. And um, uh, uh, and so relatively less happened via full recovery of the IBC process. Uh, so, 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 so I think that one should give credit, but also one realize that it could have been much, much better. Uh, and so, 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 so the opportunity cost of the capital that went, uh, that, that was lost, and the fact that taxpayer money so much had to be thrown, uh, you know, uh, to kind of, mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, notice that that is politically a little bit problematic because essentially what you're saying is that uh, you, you've basically subsidized uh, the, 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 the big players who kind of went into bankruptcy and didn't have to pay the cost because basically it was written off and the debt. So, so I think that's the larger you know, way in which one should look at you know, what happened in the, uh, about you know, the twin balance sheet problem and how, right. we, how we came out of it. And now, uh, speaking of political issues, uh, the, the current CEA, he recently made a statement uh, when the ILO uh, employment report came out. He basically made the point that uh, you can't lay the burden of all social and economic problems on the shoulders of the government. Things like employment, the private sector needs to step in and uh, shoulder its own share of the burden. Uh, is this something that you, you agree with that? Yeah, see, I, I think it's a, it's a slightly uh, unusual way of putting it because I, I, I think this begs the begs the question of you know why isn't the private sector do, doing Absolutely. this? Absolutely. Yeah. And see, I think to be fair to what the CEA said, I think the one thing that you know intellectual discourse has got so polarized that you know uh, you know you you kind of lambast the mm -hmm. other side. I think on the employment problem. Uh, lack of jobs and formal jobs and employment. I mean, this has been a problem in India for 50 years. It's not a, a problem of, of, of this particular government, right? right? And I think to, th to that extent, if he's suggesting that, I think that's a fair remark. But I think it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what the government, sh uh, the way the government should be looking at it is, what can it do to get the private sector to invest and create more jobs? Right. So, for example, something that I've spoken about a, a lot uh, is that, you know, we should be focusing a lot more in helping uh, the private sector, you know, become globally competitive in the mm -hmm. sectors that China is vacating, you know, clothing, footwear, toys, all these labor intensive sectors is where I think, you know, uh, I would, you know, help the private sector to, you know, uh, invest in those sectors, right. become globally competitive and create jobs. Uh, and so the question is, you know, even if you look at the PLI scheme, uh, it's, it's a lot more focused on these, you know, high tech, you know, capital intensive sectors. And it's not that it's absent, but, you know, the emphasis has been much more on these, you know, uh, those sectors. And, you know, when I was in government, I don't know whether you remember, we had a package for the clothing and apparel yes, industry, right? I do. Uh, I would kind of, you know, uh, you know, emphasize those sectors because A, there's an opportunity because of China and B, the window is small because this is not an opportunity that's going to endure because of artificial intelligence and even, you know, the labor intensity of these sectors is probably going to decline over time. Right. Uh, but so the window is not very wide to, to capitalize on this opportunity. So I would, that's why what I see happening in Tamil Nadu, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, scale employment in footwear, uh, in, in electronics. I mean, we should be doing this in Odisha, in Uttar Pradesh, in Bihar, you know, because labor is still very cheap there. Absolutely. A and I think, uh, you know, a kind of a national uh, effort to create labor intensive sectors, you know, uh, and these, remember, these are all sectors where female employment is very high as well. Yes. Uh, and so uh, I would uh, very much, you know, uh, hope that, you know, we could refocus on, on those sectors which are employment intensive a and the attitude being not why are why isn't the private sector doing it but how can we work with the private sector to create those to create the investment to create the competitiveness to create the you know exports and therefore the jobs that will come with that so that would be the way i would look at it okay uh, but this kind of flies in the face of uh, say what even Raghuram Rajan was uh, recommending where he was saying that we should double down on exports we should educate and skill our youth and uh, put them on uh, services and export our services. Yeah, uh, that's a very odd argument to make, uh, I would say, uh, because high-skill service you know, employment can generate 
two, three, four percent of the constitute two, three, four percent of the labor force. So that might give us dynamism, but it'll certainly not give us inclusive growth. Uh, because uh, and the notion that you know our education systems are you know proverbially have been so uh, you know so uh, weak that to somehow argue I mean it's a bit like saying that you know over the next ten years we you know seven hundred million people from the current levels of education you can make them uh, IIT whatever whatever right. you know I, I'm exaggerating a little bit but but I think that is a recipe for uh, I think it's it's a it's a recipe for non inclusive growth. And it's very odd coming at a time precisely when there's a China opportunity that allows you to do things that you couldn't do in the past. I think I that's, see. I think, uh, why I would double down, you know, for the next five, ten years uh, exactly to, you know, take advantage. Because remember, all the opportunities that are create, being created by China is being filled up either by Vietnam or Bangladesh or Indonesia. And, you know, we have a chance now, you know, we've built up our infrastructure, uh, our connectivity, uh, uh, you know, uh, and the world is looking to us because, uh, because remember Vietnam and Bangladesh and Indonesia, etc., can never offer the kind of scale that an, a real alternative to China requires, right? right? And that's where, so it's our moment actually, it is our moment to capitalize on. Uh, not, not by doing services, not by saying, oh, private sector, why aren't you doing it? But actually working with the private sector in these sectors to create those jobs. And, and, and I think people forget that, you know, we still have Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, Rajasthan, Odisha, uh, you know, uh, uh, places where we, labor is still plentiful and, and should be tapped. Absolutely. But uh, do you feel that the building block blocks are in place for us to take this uh, yeah, I think, forward? I, I think uh, to be, I mean, to give credit to the government, I think, uh, uh, you know, and to previous governments, you know, the infrastructure build up, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is now, uh, you know, whether you look at ports or roads or railway, you know, uh, are uh, the, because remember, being internationally competitive means, you know, internal and global connectivity absolutely yeah with the gst we've actually created a common market so i think on the infrastructure and the connectivity side which are very important also for global competitiveness mm -hmm. i think we've done a good job we've created the conditions but then we need to do you know the next steps uh, to 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 capitalize on this window created by china so now you mentioned gst and that actually was my my final question which uh, in the run-up to it, you had submitted your uh, report on the revenue neutral rate of 15%. But then the government in its wisdom chose to go in a multi-rate kind of format. But now that GST is, as you have also analyzed, it's, it's now giving larger revenues than the pre-GST period, finally. Finally, finally yeah. Do you, uh, do you feel that it's time for the next government post-elections to do a comprehensive review and reduce the number of rates, simplify the system? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Sharad, you're absolutely right. See, I would separate out two things, Sharad, and this mm. is that. See, uh, one is the level and the other is the structure of the rates. Uh, so these are two. Right. Uh, I think part of the reason why we've taken six years almost to reach the pre-GST revenue uh, which, you know, I wrote this recent piece. Yes. We only now realized we thought we were doing well before, but because we didn't take account of the refunds, yes. we realized only exactly. now that we, we've done that. See, I, I think that uh, probably two things explain uh, why it's taken us so long. One is, uh, you know, we went on this rate cutting spree uh, in eight, 17, 18, 19, if right. you remember that, right? Uh, the RBI calculated that basically, you know, I had said, remember, 15 and a half was a revenue. 15 and, and a half, half. Yes. I think uh, the RBI calculated that we went from some 14 and a half to about 11 and a half or something. 11.6, I think. Six, exactly, right? yeah. exactly. So that's a real big rate cut, right? Uh, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And so we lost a lot of revenue there, mm -hmm. right? One. Second, I, you know, it, it just, I recommended three rates, as you know, but we got <laughs> multiple. I mean, if you look at the cesses, it's like, uh, you know, they're like, 50, 60 rates on the cesses, right? Uh, and so uh, that also added by making it complex, making administration more complex, it probably also had an impact on reducing mm -hmm. uh, revenues as well. So what you said is just spot on uh, uh, that. But I just, just want to say one thing is that the reason the rates got cut is something that we anticipated that would happen. Because remember, once you have compensation, 
Right. On the one hand, compensation gets you the buy-in for the GST gotten by from the states. states. But on the other hand, they also said, you know, let's cut rates. You know, we're going to be guaranteed a 14 percent. So, 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 right. so in that, it was not just the central government, but the state governments were also complicit in that rate cutting. Mm -hmm. Right. So both were. So, but looking ahead, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that we need to look at the structure of rates, but we also probably need a little bit of rate increases because you know it's now, you know, you're way down to whatever now it is the RBI has calculated. Right. Uh, so compared to my revenue neutral rate of 15, uh, we're probably, if, they, if they're right, 11 and a half. Uh, so we have lost uh, some, some amount. So if we could go back and just, and, and remember the, the, uh, the uh, uh, suspension or the, the fact that this cess no longer is, is in play means that it's also an opportunity to simplify the cess as well. Right. Uh, so, so uh, yeah. So, so getting rates back up to whatever a little bit more, and just going back to you know whatever three rates. I think the one rate is still maybe very elusive, but we should be able to go back to you know some simple structure like three rates. But that will require real, you know, it will require a kind of the kind of spirit of cooperative federalism that went into the you know the fact that the GST came into being was an amazing you know, effort at cooperative federalism. Right. But we need to get that back. And the question is, is there trust between some of the states and the center today? To is do, there? Uh, I'm, I'm asking you deliberately, <laughs> not, not answering the question. Right. Uh, and unless we get that, I, I don't think it will be possible to do exactly what you're suggesting should be done. Uh, you know, that background, without that background trust between the center and the states, I think this is going to be, you know, the status quo, bickering, you know, all of this is going to continue. And, and I think that is the bigger challenge. That's a, a more important precondition for getting it. I understand. But on that note, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. And thank you so much for watching.